Yeah, that's cool. When we played Don Juan at Michigan State, I do remember that one of the horn players, um, being a typical horn player, took the horn theme and inverted it. And so when Leon looked back and gave us the cue, we played it upside down. Uh huh. Yeah. Nobody really knew what was going on at the get the beginning, but it was funny. Yeah. See, there are band geeks and then there are horn players. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> kind of the pranksters in the back. <laughs> Don't tell the tuba players that they're not. Well, I think sometimes we're just there to babysit the low brass and the trumpets, but oops, was that out loud? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode 52. My guest for this episode is Jenny Neff. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time, and I hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, on to the episode. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Jenny, could you start by, um, well, first I should say thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Can you um, introduce yourself to the listeners and tell them where you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Jenny Neff, and I'm outside of Philadelphia, and I am in my 25th year of public school teaching as a middle school band director. And I've taught at all different levels. Um, the past 15 have been in middle school. And I also recently took on the interim director of Master of Music and Summer Music Studies programs at UArts, which is in Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. And so 25 years of teaching in the public schools. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, one of the things, and I'll ask you this question right off the top. One of the things I noticed, I just got back from TMEA. Yep. And so even though this interview is coming out in, in March, um, we're recording this right after that. And so one of the things I noticed, and I noticed it at every MEA I go to, and I've been to three this year, is how young all the teachers are. <laughs> yeah. And so you've made it 25 years. So do you have any thoughts about how you how you manage to do that and not not leave early like many of our colleagues do? Well, I think it's <clears throat> a combination of things. I think, you know, doing what you love and loving what you do is really important. So making sure that you're in the right field to start with and then just always keeping it fresh for yourself in some way. Um, I think that for me, I've changed positions about every seven or eight years. Um, maybe not intentionally, but just new opportunities that came, you know, in my path. So, you know, I've gone from being a little bit of general music at the beginning in elementary to high school band to middle school strings, general music band to just all middle school band. And I think just being open to to different opportunities. I think, you know, when I got out of undergrad and my master's because I did those right in a row, I think you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be a high school band director. And that was not what I was at the beginning. And if you had asked me 25 years ago if I was going to teach middle school, I would have said no. Um, so I think just, you know, being open to different sorts of opportunities and paths along the way um, can give you some really interesting and unique experiences and great opportunities. What's your instrument? I'm a horn player, and I also play a lot of piano day to day. I haven't played a lot of horn lately since my doctorate, but um, that is my main instrument. And so how did you get into music? What's What, what were the early years like? Um, I was kind of a jack of all trades. And fortunately, I had parents who were and still are very uh, supportive of, of my music and really all arts. Um, I was taking ballet at three for 13 years following that. I was doing painting classes, drawing classes. I was playing piano in second grade. Um, and then I was always involved in like church choir, things like that, singing and then handbells. And so in I think around fifth grade, uh, the high school students came and demonstrated instruments for us. And I was kind of looking at the clarinet, I think maybe because my next door neighbor played that. 
And the line for that was too long. So I went to this thing called the French horn. And that was a short line, of course. And uh, I was able to uh, produce some sounds right away. And they were like, oh, my God, she's really good. Of course, they probably say that to everybody who's in the line. Um, you should hear so the I decided, line. <laughs> I decided to play the French horn. And it worked out really well. Um, and so I continued to play that. And I did piano and horn all the way through, um, well, I mean, even till today, but um, I didn't play as, you know, piano in college as much, but I took lessons and, you know, also did like uh, music theory lessons and, and things like that. So my, my mom tells stories of how she would call, I'm from Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, which is a small town, central PA, and you know, not exactly the thriving metropolis of the arts, but, um, you know, some good resources in the area. And she was always seeking those out. So she talks about, you know, calling Bucknell and calling Susquehanna and like all but begging on the phone, like, please teach my daughter. <laughs> so I was really fortunate, um, you know, to have some really good teachers at a young age and to have people in my high school teaching that were, you know, really great, great teachers. And middle school too, and elementary, but yeah. Can you think of any lessons that you may have learned from some of those teachers that you're still using today? Oh, wow. Oh, probably so many that I don't even identify, but just do innately. Um, wow. I mean, I think just the discipline and rapport that was built at the same time, you know, discipline for the craft and the art form, yet always having that rapport with your students um, I'm, you know, still, I'm Jim Jordan was my choir director and now he's at Westminster Choir College. And, you know, I saw him at Midwest and we've had coffee and, you know, we're still in touch and we text and, um, Scott Smith was my horn teacher and also private, my, my horn teacher, private horn teacher, and also my band director, um, and also taught me theory. And now he's at Ohio university and we're still in touch and I know his wife. And so I think, you know, just, having a connection with these people that's kind of lifelong, um, that they're really important in your life and, you know, genuinely, genuinely care about what you're doing outside of music too, which is, I think, part of supporting our students. Um, I had a student call last night who is an adult now and had a job interview and just wanted some advice. And so I think, you know, just kind of carrying on that tradition of passing the music on and, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So do you have any specific memories or specific moments in high school um, or even before where you knew that you were going to be a professional musician or you knew you were going to be a teacher? Um, well, it's funny because I, I always have this question I like to ask people in an interview, which is, what did you do as a child? I think that's a really telling um, answer in a lot of situations. And I think I always remember teaching, you know, whether it be you know, having school in our little play area or um, helping my brother with homework or, or whatever it may have been, um, kind of always tutoring other people or babysitting. And so I think, <clears throat> you know, that just grew into this career, um, but also just taking on leadership roles at an early age, you know, being high school drum major, that sort of thing, I think lends itself to thinking about that I, at the beginning I was actually a combination of music therapy and music ed because mm -hmm. I really like psychology and then after about a semester of that at Michigan State I, I decided that you know maybe I would just go into the music ed route. So now you mentioned Michigan State that was your undergraduate master's? Yes. And so how did you end up in Michigan from Pennsylvania? Um, well, my horn teacher in high school was a Michigan State grad, and I was looking around at schools um, in the Northeast all the way out to Michigan State, and uh, there weren't many schools at the time that had music therapy as well, so that narrowed it down quite a bit. Sure. But um, Scott said, you know, you need to go and look at the school, and then Doug Campbell, who was my horn teacher, he came on a tour to the East Coast and... Um, you know, visited my high school, met my parents and that sort of thing. So um, when I met him, you know, he seemed like a nice guy. And I went out to visit Michigan State. And as soon as I walked on the campus, I was like, wow, I, I want to be here because mm -hmm. it's a beautiful campus. And uh, it was a great place to be. And it, it 
gave me some really great opportunities. Even one of the things I like the most is even as an ed major, I think in different programs, you might find that, you know, they may treat the ed versus the performance majors very differently and give them different opportunities. And I felt that, you know, if you were an ed major and you played just as well as a performance major, you had similar opportunities. So it was nice to be able to continue to, you know, practice and and achieve in that area while you're getting your ed degree. I think it's really important. Absolutely. I agree with that hundred percent. I think we do a disservice to our education majors if we don't do that. Absolutely. So what does your current program look like? And I'm not going to try to say, well, I'll try to say it. Bala Kinwood. Yep. Bala Kinwood middle school. What does the program look like there? How many students do you have? How many teachers are there? And, And sort of what's the program like? Okay. Well, we have in our middle school and there are two middle schools in the district, we have four music teachers. I teach all the bands, so sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, separate bands. There are two jazz bands that someone else teaches, and those are outside of school. And then there are there's a sixth grade orchestra and a seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade combined orchestra and a chamber auditioned orchestra. And my colleague teaches that. And then we have two other music teachers that direct the choirs. There's a grade level choir for each grade and then a select choir. And then they also teach some general music classes. So it's, it's a huge program. I would say in the band program alone, we have about 220 kids and in strings, we probably have over 120, maybe 140. So we easily, we share a room and we easily have about, I don't know, 400 kids walking in and out of our room every week between all the instrumental groups. And yeah, the choirs are big too. They're like over 200 kids in each choir. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great uh, supportive school for music. It's a supportive district for music. And um, the teachers are very supportive of, of what we do with the kids. I like the way you, you, you didn't specify band or choir or orchestra. You just talked about music teachers. Well, <laughs> I think that's really important actually. And the, the strongest departments I've worked in, um, and I, I kind of learned this in my previous department at Valley Forge Middle School. We were a great team and we all taught a lot of different things. We wore a lot of different hats. So that may have helped the camaraderie a little bit, but we were a great team and, and we never threw any one depart one part of the department under the bus. And we never while you might have certain times in the year when maybe, you know, it's your jazz fest or the choir has this special performance or the handbells are playing, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think that overall, you, you know, kind of that whole is greater than the sum of the parts, like your, your, your department benefits from being supportive of every part. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I just, this is on my mind. I just went to TMEA and I heard, um, three hours of advocacy talk. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm hoping to have him on the show. He, he saves music programs that are under threat of cuts. Right. And one of the things he talked about is how the entire district, all of the music teachers have to work together and how he's seen in districts that have failed to save the music programs. The band director will say, oh, the orchestra only has 25 people, cut them first. And then what that does mm-hmm. is it creates a, a, a loop that ends up killing the whole program. And so working together, we have to, we have to hold together. That's where our political power is because that's where the parents band together. Right. And, and actually, sadly, I mean, doing some advocacy things for PMEA earlier in earlier years, and kind of continuing advocacy all the time because that's what we need to do. But um, sometimes I get pinpointed for that because maybe I know a little too much. I don't know, um, for better or worse. But, um, you know, I've been in probably about three situations where whether on the front line or kind of, you know, in the background, we had to, um, you know, save our program or help educate parents. And I think it is important that all of your departments, and sometimes that might be all of your special areas, not just music and art, but phys ed and, and everything else that you go with one message. Because yeah, yep. if you're all saying something different, and that goes the same for if you have 10 parents at a meeting who are just irate, you know, you really need a lead person there to say, like, this is our one message. Because if you don't have that, your board members are liable to say, well, I'm you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Nobody can agree on anything and it really doesn't get you anywhere. So you have an exceptional program, it sounds like. And um, 
as I mentioned, I like the way you're working together, but can you talk to me about how the program got to be that size? Was it that way when you came in? I came in there about nine years ago and it was that big. It it's been very large for a long time. Um, our assistant principal, Gail Brown, she was band and orchestra at one time or another. So I think she always understood the intricacies of the schedule. And a lot of times we really have to think out of the box with scheduling and kind of almost hand schedule each kid. Now we went to pull out lessons this year, which has been beneficial to the students, um, at least as far as you know their music training goes. So maybe it's not as, we don't have to be as customized for individual kids, but I think it is a lot of thinking out of the box. And I think we have a really strong community that supports the arts and kind of demands that level of excellence, which is, you know, it can be stressful when you're working there, but if you're doing your job well, it's it's a beautiful place to be. Um, you know, we have some Philadelphia Orchestra members who are parents and and things like that. And so I think people who really value education and value the arts and expect that, you know, to be achieved at a high level. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so what do you think, what do you attribute your success to? What, what do you think you do that, that is, is special to you? I think I'm always learning and always looking for new ideas and always being resourceful. And I think just learning what works in your program for you, in your culture. I think maybe what I've used in other, maybe my first area of teaching in more of a blue collar area um, is not the same thing that's going to work in suburbia, Philadelphia. So I think just getting to know the students, building relationships with them, building that rapport and being able to just kind of put all those pieces of the puzzle together to really engage the students in what they're doing and keep them committed. I think mm -hmm. too in middle school, I, you know, just the past 15 years I've been in middle school and I think that's really, I call middle school kids the survivors. You know, they come in as they come in being babysat and they come, they come in being babysat and they leave as babysitters. And there's quite a transition going on, you know, with them in so many areas during that time. And I think they're just looking for a place to belong and kind of finding their niche in life. And for our kids, a lot of times it is in our ensembles. Yeah. I love junior high kids. That's my favorite age. Yeah, they're fun. They're a little quirky sometimes, but it, it's it's fun. <laughs> quirky is a kind way to put it. <laughs> Well, and I think too, you've had kids, you know, you have kids that are really into it and then you have kids who might not be in so, might not be so into it, but you can never rule out that they might be into it later because maybe they're just going through this developmental craziness. Um, and I've seen kids who barely pick their instrument up and then a couple years later, they just kind of like cross over that hump or whatever they're dealing with and, um, you know, they're, they're really into it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think so. I, uh, I actually didn't play in seventh and eighth grade and I picked my trumpet back up in ninth grade. Oh yeah. So, so I never, you, you I never actually, even, did, were you going to use the Q word? You quit? I quit. I quit. Our, we had a family move in sixth grade. We, oh we moved. My gosh. And when we moved to a new school, it was overwhelming to me. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, the band just became too much and too many different things. And, it just didn't work out. I changed schools again and just, um, yeah, I just didn't go back to it until high school. And, uh, yeah, you just never know. Yeah. Well, and when I taught high school, I had some kids in this piano class. One of the first questions I would always ask them is why are you in this class? Because it was an elective. And a lot of times they weren't music kids that I'd see in other ensembles. And it was kind of sad. They'd say like, because all my friends have a talent and I feel like I don't. You know, and I kind of feel like maybe those kids were involved in something earlier and just, you know, got sucked into the whole social scene and said like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. Or just, you know, they didn't have an adult guiding them to say like, no, you really should try to stick it out or that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a telling answer. Um, you know, that search for acceptance at that, at that age. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what it's all about, right? Yeah. And that's the best part of band, at least in my memories. Right. 
Yeah, and I think that I think as a teacher, you have to be able to acknowledge that that not everybody's there for the high level musicality. You know, that's that's a great benefit for those kids. But and you do have kids who are there for that. But there are kids that are th- just there for social reasons, and it's important to be able to reach everybody because they might be the kid that's sitting on the symphony board or making decisions about school budgets later on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. I teach music appreciation, and I have kids that sit in there who just are passing the time to get their credits. And right. some who are, um, you know, on the edge of their seats. Well, few of those, but <laughs> I teach them equally, right? They're, they're the same right. to me. And so, yeah. So, Jenny, I first met you at Midwest. You were presenting with Scott Watson on Skype sessions with composers. And one of the questions I often ask is, what's the value of bringing composers into your program? So you must have some thoughts about this. Well, actually, I've brought in a lot of guest artists, but I had never brought a composer in and certainly not via Skype like like we did with Scott. Um, but it was really great for the kids to be able to meet a live composer. You know, I think growing up, we think of, especially for me as a horn player sitting in orchestra and like, who's this Beethoven guy, you know, or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, as a kid, you don't really even get to think of a face with a name unless it's in some history book. And I thought it was a great opportunity for our kids to meet someone who wrote the music. And in the if our end goal is to have the kids and the ensembles communicate an idea to the audience, who better to ask about that idea than the composer, you know, him or herself. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, and, and Scott and I were talking about this one day. We couldn't even remember really how we met, but I think I had approached him at a conference and said, hey, we're, we're going to play one of your pieces. And then we were talking about maybe him visiting because he's only about an hour from our school. And then it ended up that we decided to Skype because of the schedule. And then that went really well. And I said to him, Hey, would you ever want to write an article or present a session on this? And he was like, yeah, we could do a session. So we just kind of started brainstorming, but you know, the kids really liked meeting with him and asking questions and they took it very seriously. Kids who I would never see mark their music before were like feverishly writing things down. So um, that was kind of fun to see. And, and they took a little extra time in preparing their music because it was kind of like, Oh, we're having company over. Um, And, and then they, they took that to heart, you know, and really worked on the parts that he said he wanted to see improvements in and he was very specific. And it was also nice, you know, I think when you like when you go to any adjudication and maybe you've told the kids something a hundred times, but someone else says it, and it's like, oh my God, the voice of God is spoken. You know, it's like all of a sudden they believe it. So um I think that was, you know, just the extra, extra oomph they needed to hit those points home. Yeah. And so that was a wonderful session. Do you have any tips for maybe some listeners who might be thinking about doing a Skype session with someone? Um, Well, I think, you know, the technology is really important. I did a Skype session with a band after that, and we had some technical difficulties with um, the the speakers we were using. um, And so, or the microphone, really, I guess it was. And so I think just making sure your technology is lined up. And I know Scott was really good with that, lining up all the different tips. And I think they have that available on the Midwest um, website now if people want to download it. And I think also, I don't know what you've experienced if you've Skyped with bands, but I think it really helped having the kids come up with questions beforehand because we didn't waste time kind of like who's going to ask the next question or you don't really know what they're going to say. You could kind of preview those. Um, so I think, I think that was really fun and the kids really enjoyed it. I think they got a lot out of it. Um, like I said, they, they like having something that's kind of new and they feel, I think between that and maybe I've had guest artists come in on like brass and saxophone and clarinet and um, they you know get that little extra attention, which is is good, I think. And so how about commissions? Have you done any? You know what? I have not. That's not an an area I've gone into. And hearing you guys all talk about that with a lot of composers at Midwest, I was like, hmm, that sounds like an interesting area. Um, And the consortiums that are, you know, to me, a little bit newer for someone who's been around for a long time. um, I think those, those seem like really neat opportunities especially if you're looking at like kind of limited funding. I think the consortium is a really great model to use. Sure. I'm just going to plug that for a moment if you don't mind. Um, Yeah, absolutely. I worked with a a group or a a nonprofit called Music 
Shoot. <laughs> composers and schools and concert. CSIC, composers and schools and concert. And what they do is they put composers in touch with schools and vice versa. And so for me, I did a string orchestra piece and there were five orchestras, five groups, and it was a $500 buy-in for each group. Wow. And that was it. And with that, they got three Skype sessions with me each. So I did 15 Skype sessions. Wow, that's and great. So yeah, yeah. So it's a great opportunity to kind of work with a composer and and it's good for the composer because we like to get paid and it's good for the schools because it's a relatively um, inexpensive buy-in and the larger the consortium, typically the lower the fees. So yeah, just really plug that idea. Yeah, that's great. I think anytime you can bring in something that's a little novel or different for the kids. Um, I know we had a local, um, at my last school, we had the Criterion's Jazz Band come in from Westchester and my student teacher at the time was in the group. And it was kind of fun. The, one of the days we had them come in, they we were playing a chart of ours and one by one, they'd go in and kind of stand next to a certain part, like say the first trumpet, their first trumpet would go and like replace our first trumpet. And it was kind of fun because by the end, it was the Westchester Criterions and not our jazz band. But the kids got to hear the chart they'd been playing, played by college kids. So just something like that was kind of fun and different. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. You mentioned you had a student teacher. How many have you had over the years? A lot? Um, I've had three. I didn't really have student teachers until I started teaching middle school. Um, I really like that. And I think that's kind of what got me interested in, you know, doing some more higher ed experience and um, working with the PMEA mentor program. I, you know, I kind of feel like once we get to the 25th year of our career, um, it's kind of time to give back to our profession a little bit and help new teachers who are coming in. And I, I really enjoy that. So it's kind of just a change in my path. And so what are you looking to provide as a mentor or as a supervisor or a student teacher? What sort of, what are the things, the key things that you look to impart? Um, I think whatever their individual needs are and just getting that transition from kind of theory into practice in the classroom. I think I, I see issues sometimes with things like pacing, um, scheduling, depending on what your background's been, just kind of understanding the things that are more on the job training than in the classroom. And I think, too, getting to know the culture of the place where you work is is a huge part of it. Um, it can be so, so different depending on where you go. I agree. I've taught a lot of different places, and that is most certainly the case among the faculty and the students. Mm-hmm. Jenny, can you talk to me about what you're doing exactly with UArts as far as the teacher um, program? Well, I'm teaching a middle school methods class for their MAT program, which is a Master of Arts in Teaching, which is a fifth year degree or fifth year um, that they add on to their undergrad. But the other position I took on as interim is um, the director of the Master of Music and Summer Music Studies program. And that's been a really fun experience for me. I just kind of stepped into that in October. And we have a great team working at the College of Continuing Studies. And we plan courses. They used to be known as the Villanova Summer Music Courses. And then about, I think about three years ago, UArts kind of overtook that for accreditation purposes, but we still have a campus at Villanova. And then we also have Ursinus College and UArts. And then we also teach at Scott Watson's high school in his district in Parkland. And so we offer courses for the MM and then also courses, you know, we have matriculated and non-matriculated courses just for anyone who would want to go back and take a course, maybe in instrument repair or in some sort of band repertoire reading, or we have different levels of ORF. I think we're in our 10th year of ORF. Um, we have vocal, songwriting, drums, all different things. So it, it's pretty neat. And we're able to, I think we have the flexibility that maybe other programs don't have where we can bring in different instructors from around the country, which has been really fun. In your experience, then, what do you think we can do to better prepare music teachers for their careers? I know this kind of gets back to that opening question I asked you. Yeah, this is tough because, I mean, teaching has definitely changed. And someone asked me at Midwest, a younger teacher here, 
and we were having lunch and he said, what do you think's changed the most in 25 years? And first I felt old answering that. <laughs> and secondly, I was thinking, well, we certainly have a lot more paperwork and just, you know, things with new teacher evaluation systems and kind of this extra work that we're doing. Um, but to me, I kind of like to think about what things haven't changed. And I think those are the places where we can best prepare ourselves. That's not to say you shouldn't know something about music standards or your lesson plan writing or your teacher evaluation system your state's using. But I think kind of thinking about what we went into it for, and that's, you know, the kids and the content and being able to know both of those things to the best of your ability. I think sometimes we get out of college and we know a lot of the content and we say, oh, we want to, you know, perform this piece and we want to conduct this piece. But really, it's what's best for the kids and the level that you're teaching at. Um, so I think whatever we can equip them with to understand maybe what kids are going through today and and then just how to break things down, I think we're also in a kind of a new culture of you can look anything up on the internet. And I've seen younger teachers even who are in the field say like, oh, I found this great lesson plan online and kind of this like one and done mentality versus something that's spiraled and sequential and leading to that bigger music making piece at the end for our students that it might be a fun lesson that you might do every once in a while like on its own freestanding but that really the majority of what we should be doing should lead to this higher aesthetic you know experience and the fun experience for our kids you know one of the things i notice and i've been teaching for about as long as you have most of mine only 4 years at the below college level but 20 years in, at the university level and i see this a lot is that um you know, sometimes we go into the classroom, and this happened to me when I was starting high school too, and we think like adults and we think of adult issues mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking of kid issues. And so we're thinking about our own egos first. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of coming to that level of realizing why you're in it. Um, and I think part of that might be if we're, if we're coming out of a high level of musicianship, you know, we have had those egos really build up. And then we're kind of coming to this new level of, you know, whether you're teaching kids how to sit in a circle in kindergarten or whatever, um, it's quite different than, you know, playing Beethoven 9 or whatever. So what hard-earned lessons about being a teacher would you like to pass on? Jeez. I think a lot of times early in my career, especially as I got to like uh, maybe to, I don't want to, I don't know how to say this, but to different sorts of communities where the parents maybe were a little bit more high pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I think we find that sometimes in, in this suburbia area where I am now, sure. um, the parents are really passionate about their kid. And I think you need to know, like, you know, they'd give the right arm for their kid. They'd kind of do anything for their kid. And and sometimes we do see that get out of, a, out of balance. And mm -hmm. that's kind of rare for me to have a parent kind of come at you or send you the nasty email or whatever. But I think just always knowing that, you know, kind of thinking to yourself, why is this person telling me this? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they don't mean it in a personal attack or a personal way. And I think if you're dealing with maybe what people might call a problem parent, um, you know, maybe there's something that something else that it really is and not something with the school or the program. Um, but I think, you know, when you get that parent email and something that or even a something happens that upsets you and you kind of overthink it. I think, you know, there's one thing about thinking ahead and planning ahead and being thoughtful. And then I think everything has kind of a double-edged sword as you get older in your career. And, you know, being thoughtful and thinking can also be overthinking. Where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Uh, I think it goes back to a little bit what we were saying about supporting your entire department. And I think it's interesting. Some of the research I've read has said that creative people and, and people in an ensemble sort of setting that we do need extrinsic and intrinsic, like a balance of those two types of motivation that we're not necessarily one or the other. And I've seen that definitely 
at middle school, like we're teaching the kids to be independent individual musicians, but then also part of an ensemble. And it's also a very social setting and it's a balance of how much socializing versus being extremely social and, and chatty during rehearsal you want. But I think just trying to figure out what makes the group their best without losing sight of other things around them. I, I mean, I've had jazz bands that I remember one year we were going to competitions and they were very good. And um, we were even played at like an Eastern division conference and that sort of thing. Like, you know, they were getting a lot of kudos. They were getting a lot of trophies and, and we went to one of these like, you know, amusement park things at the end of the year. And I was kind of embarrassed because we were just sweeping some awards. And um, I decided the next year that I didn't really want to do that, that, I would rather go have them do something like give back to the community. And so we went and played at a veterans hospital at like a home that they had. And I didn't really know how the kids would take it because they hadn't performed anything like that. And they loved it. Like I actually had them fill out this little reflection thing at the end. And they were saying like, this is the best field trip we've ever had. You know, it was very refreshing. So that kind of taught me like, we need to kind of think about not always trophy, 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 certainly not to sacrifice the rest of the department and the program, but just to always keep the kids kind of in line with like what else is going on in the world other than just we're number one or, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I used to um, take kids on those trips to the amusement park once a year, but I didn't do it for the competition. I did it for the performance, but I did it really to build camaraderie you know it was kind of like a reward kind of deal yeah and i know some places who've just kind of created their own um adjudication at school and then they'll just go to the amusement park for fun like just as you know if you don't want to if you maybe your program's in a position where you don't want to spend a lot of money or or something like that too yeah and you know it's funny to watch the i I'm, just have me reflecting on like watching my band react to the awards when they would win or they would lose, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> even mm -hmm. though I never emphasized that in the classroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting to think about that. And you're right. Probably should separate it from that. I was just invited to do, uh, to be a clinician at um, uh, an unfestival here in Missouri. Do you have those in Pennsylvania? Unfestival. No, an that's unfestival. A yeah. So it's all we're doing is we're giving comments and we're doing clinics, but we're not oh. doing any judging. There's no scores. Yeah, huh, it's kind of cool. Yeah, and so it's it's a chance to get together and have the the educational aspect without the the competition aspect. Mm hmm. That's interesting. And yet, and yet, you know, like we're talking about the balance. Yet, I've had kids come back who maybe are college music educator or music ed majors and saying, "Oh, the best time was in middle school. We did all those competitions." You know, so it just it just really kind of depends on what they're going through too. Well, and DCI is very popular. We can't discount the fact that some kids and some programs thrive on that. Yeah, that's true. And so, I mean, I think there's there's balance to be had. I think there's Yeah, a I think definitely. I think there's good things in, in all of it. Yep. So speaking of balance and teacher issues, <laughs> how do you mm -hmm. find a work-life balance? <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, I work really hard and I, I also feel that it's important to play really hard. And so I think just... Although I think that, you know, we have times when things are pretty intense, like, you know, even now for me doing some other opportunities, but I know that maybe those won't continue long term, that that's just for an interim period um, or maybe a transition period. Yeah, you know, I try to schedule in things, schedule travel, schedule time with friends. And although that seems a little inauthentic at times, um, I think we kind of have to do it in in the world we're living in. Otherwise, you know, with technology, um, we could almost like work around the clock and, and we certainly don't want to do that. Um, I think, you know, the people who are having work life balance issues are, are not those who aren't doing anything. Um, I think it's just, you know, trying to be conscious of scheduling in and then and scheduling in your, your downtime, but also just finding those blocks of time. I know for me at the beginning of this year, I kind of mapped out a lot of like my months and different professional development things I was doing and conferences and just tried to map out like what chunk of time do I need? And, you know, even something as 
getting as nitty gritty as like my calendar on my phone. I've tried to go with the phone calendar and that works pretty well, but I still am like a paper girl. I need like the hard copy paper calendar more to get a big picture for myself uh, to see kind of like I do need free weekends here and there or I need chunks of time um, to do some of the projects or not just to relax. And I think time also to kind of celebrate when you have a lot of these really cool things going on. I think it's time to celebrate and, and relax. And I think that creative people also need time to recharge. Um, the other thing you were asking about um, success and things you would tell new teachers. And I think I read an article recently about successful endeavors versus significant endeavors. And I think as we get older, I think at the beginning you're saying, oh, I got to do all these things to build my resume and that sort of thing. And you want to be successful. You want to be good at what you do. But I think as we get a little more into the um, profession, we start thinking about like what what's significant to me. So what are the challenges facing music education as we move forward to the 21st century? And how do we oh, wow. address some of those? Oh, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone says. Oh, ah. Uh. I think what, you know, I think what we do in our profession and in music education is is part of what makes us human, right? I think we always want that. Um, I think that kids are being pulled at in a lot of different directions, whether that be social media, um, STEM versus STEAM, you know, all of these initiatives coming at them that may take them away from who they are. I mean, it might also help them figure out who they are, but I think, I, I think especially at like middle school where I see these, you know, younger kids who don't know what they want to be yet and that's okay. And yet they might be kind of forced into different tracks. Um, I think it's important for them to be able to really figure out who they are for a while before they have to start limiting their options. Um, and, and I think, yeah, we do see, we do see people being asked to do a lot more in the teaching field, and it's it's stressful. It's definitely changed, I think, even in the past five years, um, the things that we're being asked to do, the responsibilities, the accountability, and, and not that we don't want to be held accountable, but just, you know, a lot more in paperwork and things like that, um, that it takes you away from, from the teaching, you know, um, and I, I think it's hard to it's, it's hard to do it. And I think you need to have the stamina as a teacher and you need to have the support. I, I think that everybody's asked, being asked to do more with less and, you know, whether that be time or money or support or people being spread too thin, I think, you know, we need to find a way to survive in it. Um, I think also our, even our administrators are being asked to do more and they're being pulled in many different directions. So I, I don't so much worry about the first year teacher coming in because they probably have a mentor or they're close enough to their undergrad or their graduate program or some sort of education training that they have support connections. But I do worry about um, the second or third or fifth year teacher who might need a little extra support or a teacher who's changed uh, content areas. Maybe they're teaching you know, orchestra instead of band, or maybe now they're really a band person and they've been asked to teach choir or something like that because they're being asked to do more with less. I do worry about the stress that we put on our teachers there. And so I think, you know, like for our state, we have a mentor program. I think that's going to be increasingly important for, for all of our teachers. Yeah, that's a good answer. So what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? I guess I would say to just let some things be, you know, that not everything needs an answer at that time and that it's not worth overthinking things. I think when you, especially when you're younger and worrying about what other people think, like, you know, you know, inside yourself what's right and what's right for you. And you need to listen to that. And I think always as a younger person being open to other people's suggestions to never say never. I mean, if I had said, said I would never teach middle school, I would not be doing that for the past 15 years and, and loving it. Um, so I think you just never know where life's going to take you and you just need to be to open to those 
to those paths, whether they're known or unknown. If you had a chance, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band or orchestra that you would conduct and why? Well, maybe this is the teacher in me, but I would say, and I've had exposure exposure to a lot of great orchestral and wind ensemble rep, just, you know, different groups I played in. Um, I would say a piece that my students enjoy playing. I mean, because I think that when you're standing in front of students that you've taught for a long time, and maybe at middle school, since we've taught from kind of the mechanical to the musical, which is a hard transition to make sometimes, um, I think the songs and the pieces that when you play them and you announce, you announce the name and the kids go, yes, you know, like, you know, they like that piece. I think that kind of reflects on you as the conductor too and it makes that experience more important um i think yeah. either that or for me it might be going a little bit bigger just i think kind of all along in my experiences i've been able to connect to other areas of the arts and have that complexity and maybe a little more depth than maybe just like a band person would have um like i re- i recall you know, being in the pit for West Side Story and and just seeing everything kind of come together at the end of that first act. You know, you have the dancing and the singing and the pit and you're just like part of the whole thing. And I think for me, a lot of times it's experiences like that um, or conducting a string ensemble in front of a castle in Austria or whatever it is. Like, it's kind of like, wow, this is a moment I need to remember. This is an experience I need to remember. And so I think For me, since I've had a lot of great experiences like that under various conductors, I think recreating that for my students is something I'd like to give back. Mm -hmm. My guests are getting very good at dodging the question. Oh, good. Am I in that category now? (laughs) So far, so good. I'm usually pretty good about being persistent. Are you going to give me a piece or not? (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I'm always like, uh, I'm always a sucker for like a good, like sappy Irish tune from County Dairy or something like that. You know, that's like three straight interviews that's come up that piece. Oh, yes. Trifecta. (laughs) All right. We'll go with that since I love that piece too. (laughs) Or something really big, like a Don Juan or something. I don't know. Yeah. I was thinking about that. I think the, the, my answer changes as I listen to guests give their answers too, but I'm thinking Mm -hmm. uh, the marriage of Figaro. Mm, Okay. I mean, I, I can't imagine conducting an opera, and I'm intimidated by the very thought of that. Yeah. But, wouldn't but it once be- again, it's all those different pieces put together. It is kind of like pretty cool to combine all those art forms. Could you imagine what that must be like? Yeah. At the Met. You've got to say at the Met, though. <laughs> no, yeah. no. I would do it in Austria, in Vienna. Oh, yeah. That's true. All right. So is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Um. Well, I guess... I'm presenting at a couple conferences, New Hampshire and PMEA. And um, since I'm the Eastern Division representative for NAFME Band Council, I've been trying to get around and see as many like states that I'm supposed to be overseeing just to kind of get to know people. So if anybody's at that, just to say hi. And um, obviously the summer music studies is happening at UArts this summer. And we have all of our courses out now and up on the website. And so that's going to be a great experience for educators around the country who want to want a week of enrichment or some sort of training in their area. Perfect. How can people get in touch with you? Probably the easiest way is if you're interested in the UArts thing, you could get me at, at UArts, which is jenef at uarts.edu. Or my personal email is Stogner Neff, S T O G N E R Neff, N E F F at hotmail.com. I do have a website coming up, but it's it's under construction right now, but it's going to be Jenny's Creative Edge.com. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you'd like to add? No, I think we're good. Excellent. Jenny, thank you so much yes. for your time. You're welcome. 